whenever you're feeling really down and you can't get out of bed and it feels like your dream has died, right? Just tell yourself, I'm at the bottom of the second act. This is where the hero rethinks everything about the story and then rallies in that last little bit. So know when you're really down and out, you're this close. You're this close to that that third act and that third act moves fast. So the the more down you are, the closer you are to that finish line. Uh, and it's not a lonely road. It's an open road. So patience is required uh, and just have a little bit of faith um, that the next stage is coming. Hello, and thanks for tuning into Power Perspectives, People, Passion, Purpose. I'm Shannon, and today I have with me a voracious writer, kinder comic, and fabulously fun musician. Her work has appeared in award-winning publications such as Cat Fancy, The Miami Herald, Sun Sentinel, and Pulp Magazine. As a comedian, she's been on TV and radio shows, including CNN's Showbiz Today, Australia's 7 News, and CBS News. The LA Times called her comedy show a kinder, gentler, more thoughtful comedy night, and it was named both LA Weekly's Pick of the Week and Best of LA. The heroine of her 20 mystery book series entitled Mom and Christie's Cozy Mysteries is inspired by her darling mother, who really is as smart as her fictional character. And finally, her studio album of funny songs, Feeling Good, Looking Good, is available on iTunes and CD Baby. She's also got a journal out as well as a coloring book. Wow, I am so happy to speak to you. Welcome to Power Perspectives, Christy Murphy. Thank you. That's quite the intro. I really enjoyed that. Uh, that sounds great. I sound uh, better in my intro. Uh, lower your expectations, everyone. No, but it's great to be here. It's great to be here. Thanks for I'm picking me. Yeah. Of course. I'm excited to, I mean, no pressure, but I'm excited to interview a comedian. You just kind of feel like the, there's little less pressure that's on and you can just have a laugh while we're talking. So. I will say I was not a natural comedian. I started doing comedy because I was afraid to talk to people. And so it was sort of my way to get better at uh, being less shy. Uh, and it gen genuinely worked. Uh, I did a comedy show in a laundromat that got me on all those TV shows and whatnot. But it was still fun. I think that's an awesome idea. And you were you were telling me about it when we first started chatting. But what was it called? The laundromat comedy? Oh, all washed up. All washed up. All washed up. Yeah, that was perfect. I think that was yeah. incredible. <laughs> Um, well, we'll get there. I would love to talk to you like 20 books. So for most people, myself included, I'm forever writing one book and it's changed and morphed into, into 10 other things and it's still incomplete. So how did you uh, get from just your first book? Did like, did you know when you, when did you know you first wanted to become a writer? Okay, so I uh, I had my first failed novel at age nine. It was called The Place Where Nobody Has Been. I remember the title. I remember the <laughs> chapter one title, Who Am I? Because I have my third grade journal where I started it in. And that's chucked off like a, a lifelong passion of starting and stopping writing books uh, that lasted, I would say I had a really good um, 25, 30 year run on not not finishing books. So uh, I think that's very much where every writer's, uh, especially novelist job starts, is to start books and not finish them. I think that was uh, that was step one in my uh, career as a writer. Step two was I actually did NaNoWriMo, NaNoWriMo, the National Novel Writing Month in November, where you just, cool. you just sit down and you just throw out 50,000 words and you call it a novel, which, you know, technically it's a novella, but it, no, actually, I think it's, I think after 40,000, it's considered a novel. So it was, I did that and I thought it was going to be an amazing book. And then I read it and I went, oh my gosh, this is way too personal and not that great. Uh, but it was the first time I actually got to the end, which I think was the biggest part. Uh, and then from there, um, I wrote a series of uh, 50 Shades of Grayish type of books, <laughs> uh, which was like a series of four, which I've unpublished since then because they're a little too risque for Amazon. And then I finally wrote the uh, Mom and Christie mystery, the first one, which was actually an experiment in uh, writing something shorter, shorter and later, um, which if I were going to start again, I probably I probably would go with something shorter and lighter just to get that practice of finishing, um, because finishing mm -hmm. is the hardest thing for me. Starting. Ah, oh, so much fun. <laughs> I bet, um, you know, everyone that's attempted that can resonate with that also because starting is no problem i got great ideas blah, 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 but execution and even when you're almost in the end of the tunnel there's still you're nowhere near done getting that published and getting it then marketed and getting it there's a whole slew of other of other developments and processes that have to happen after that but if i can ask you when you first finished that first book and great advice by the way shorter and lighter just to feel the accomplishment of completion but when you first held that book in your hot little hands, like, how did you feel? 
I felt amazing. I actually talked about it nonstop. I, that was the way I got myself to finish that NaNoWriMo was to tell everybody I'm doing this novel in a month and I wrote it. People still remember hearing me talk about it. Um, and it, what, what happened was a friend of mine had done it. And she started four days late. Now she's considerably more prolific than I am. So she, she started four days late and finished five days early. I started the day of strong, wandered off in the middle, panicked, mm -hmm. <laughs> then started again, then stayed up for like 30 hours to finish, then slept and then went my let my sister take me out uh, where we told everybody. Actually, it was one of the few times I'm not a go out to a bar kind of person unless I'm doing comedy or something. But we went to a pub uh, and drank uh, to celebrate like writers do or so I thought <laughs> at the time and uh, told absolutely everybody in the bar that I just finished my first novel, uh, which felt fantastic. And then, you know, then the rereading, some of it actually is much better uh, I would advise when you finish that first one to put it in a drawer, because if you reread it right away, you're just going to hate it. But if you wait a little while and then read it again, you'd be surprised at how much of it you like. Yes, I have experienced that actually, like in the moment of like, this is garbage. Why did I even bother? I need to like, what did, what was I thinking? And then I've come back to something after that like you find I, I move a lot and then I found stuff in a drawer. I'm like, this is good. Like, who wrote this? It was me. And I didn't, you know. Now I'm not so harsh on myself. I'm like, this is actually okay. You've got some great advice for, for writers and it please thread those through this because they help everyone, they help me, but also um, there's an assimilation to lifestyle advice that we can, we can utilize from the writing platform. So this is wonderful. So keep it for a little while is what you're saying. So don't read it right away and judge yourself. Yeah, it's very easy to judge yourself. You'd be surprised at how much is better than you thought and how many things... I think the hardest thing for me in the beginning was that I would rewrite the same sentence over and over again. And you really don't know what that first sentence or even that first chapter is until you hit the end sometimes. So yeah. my biggest advice would be to uh, recognize that the first draft really is a draft and that it isn't as permitted as you think. And that uh, there's different reasons why some people don't do it. Some people are like, oh, I only have one idea. They have this idea. They have the greatest thing about writing books is the second you write your first, you start your first book and you think, oh my God, this is brilliant. It's going to be easy. You're going to hit this part where it's hard. And then your brain is going to tell you about five other ideas that would be <laughs> way easier. Write those down in a notebook. Um, if you start enough novels, you get way more ideas for other novels that you should be writing instead of this novel. Um, and for some people, it's actually beneficial to write two. You cheat on one with the other so that it feels like less work. For some people, for other people though, they've got to you know, keep going. And so it's just a matter of knowing, am I the kind of person who has a hard time sitting down and then once I'm in it, I'm there? Or am I the kind of person who has trouble sticking through it? Like I wrote, uh, my first major thing that I was going to publish was like a four book series, which was a really interesting thing for me to start. And it was one of those ones where it's my mom and Christy books, they're actually just eight in that series. And then there's two in another series. And then I have some romantic comedy. So they're all, all my 20 books are in different genres, but uh, eight in the mom and Christy series. But um, for that first four thing, it would, they were, you had to read them one after another, just like 50 shades of gray. I was going to go in and I was going to make all that money or whatever. And um, what happened was I wrote book one and I wrote book two and I published both of those. And I expected the millions and riches to to fall in line. It did not. And the motivation <laughs> to write books three and four started to fall away. And until I had like a reader actually write me to say, hey, are you going to actually do those other ones? I really want to know how it ends. And I went, I need to learn how to finish things regardless as to the result. And so I think one of the things that gets in the way of people doing anything, not just write a book, but anything, having a difficult conversation is we're so worried about controlling what the outcome is that we don't start. And uh, you've got to let go of what you need it to be in order to embrace what it actually is. So to write books three and four, I just said, this is about me learning to finish. And so I did. And once I was able to finish a four book series, I went, I am the kind of person who can finish. And I just uh, kept, kept, kept at it. But it really, and, and, and then surprisingly, the other books sold better when the series was complete. That's another thing. If you're publishing yourself and you're looking and you're thinking, oh, this first book didn't do much series, even if they're not, and the easiest kind of series, if you're going to self-publish this quickly, is uh, the series where it's more like episodic television, where each one could be read individually with a little recap or whatnot, because uh, those are just easier to market because people can jump in at one place and then they'll go back 
and 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 go through. But regardless, uh, series are much easier to market and. Uh, and even if you just build in the same universe like Stephen King did with all his Castle Rock or whatever um, books, uh, that also helps. It just makes it easier to market. And so um, the second and third book, much like writing it, marketing, uh, they always do better. Mm, your tips are fire. Like you could be a writing coach, I think. Actually, you should start that and see if you've <laughs> finished it. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But it's so funny from someone that's like got 20 books up to say, I'm not good at finishing stuff. So I had to train to, and I think that's a muscle that we just have to keep flexing or, or keep working to, to build. So like, great, great point. Um, so if I can ask you, you're in, in researching you, I went to see some of your books on Amazon and they're super cute. And there was a picture with you and your mom and I'm like, that's so darling. Like, so tell me about how that idea came about and then what your mom kind of how she jumped on board with you. Okay, so the reason why they're the Mom and Christy Mysteries and the first word is mom is when I wrote my first four book series um, and it was called like Lusted, it was by Pia Sparks. She can't find them, I've unpublished them all, but I think maybe one, the first one is like wandering around in the world somewhere. But uh, the main critique was the main character who, you know, I think, especially in your beginning books, there's a lot of autobiographical stuff. And the, the character had a little bit of anxiety. And honestly, um, people thought she was weird and annoying. And I noticed that the more <laughs> books that I based on me, I was like, oh, wow, especially at that time in my life, um, people couldn't relate to me as much because I'm an, I will say I, I, I won't say I'm weird. I will say I am an original person, right? I'm a niche person. And so I thought to myself, you know, who can I make the star of these books that everybody likes and that everybody would relate to? And I thought, oh, my mom. Everybody likes my mom. I I love my mom. Everybody likes my mom no matter where I go. So, um, yeah. So I made her the star of my books. And I also, if you read those books, there's like a, you know, it says a note from the author and in parentheses and her mom. And I force my mom to either be on a conference call with me or take her to Denny's if she's in town and tell her, like, what do you have to say? to my readers. And she's like, why don't you just write something? And I'll say, I said that I was like, no, you have to talk to them. <laughs> um, and now she'll like appear on my Facebook when I did like a fan, uh, like a zoom, you know, um, all they wanted to do was meet my mom, which was <laughs> you know, very easy for me. So that's why I chose my mom because the more, and I put me as the, um, as the Watson, you know, cause Watson's the one yeah. who writes it down. So, yes. uh, so that's, that's how that came to be that my more autobiographical, characters were a little bit more difficult for audiences to relate to so uh, I stole my oh. mom plus they're mysteries and I I'm, I'm not a mom but I truly believe that every mom is part detective like I just I feel like that is a requirement for the uh, job title of mom I think so too a little bit too like brown moms they got a thing of like snooping and it's okay I'm your mom like this is what we do but all right. is, yeah exactly and I'm gonna get that <laughs> confession out of you too who did this <laughs> Who did this? I'll break you individually. I, I'm the middle child. I'm the Jan Brady of my family. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and how did the the mystery kind of come about as opposed to another genre with your mom? Like, obviously, you're not going to do the Fifty Shades of Grey, but like the the um, let's solve these mysteries together. How did that genre come about? You know, it's interesting because I used to watch a lot of like Law and Order and I read all those Nancy Drew books when I was a kid. And I was trying to think of what kind of books were shorter, like genre specific or like shorter and lighter. And um, there was like a need. And so at the time, Cozy Mysteries, and they still are a pretty hot genre. There were a lot of people really interested in, in them. And they were largely, at the time I started writing those books, I was, I'm, I'm 52 now. And I think it was about 40 at the time. And the readers were my demographic. So like they were my age, you know. The books were clean because it was going to feature my mom. I swear in other books, uh, some of the people are like, oh, my God, these books are really dirty. Yeah, th but those aren't the ones featuring my mom. So um, so I j it just suited the genre. And I'd read a bunch of books in them. And I thought, oh, these are nice. And I bet you, you know, one of the greatest things to do uh, when, when you're looking to perform, like maybe stand up or write a book, is to read great books and then just read almost bad books. Like books that you don't think are that great that are doing well. Like you'll 
I would advise anybody who wants to write a novel to pick up, my first book is free, right? Mango Cake and Murder. And see how many typos are still in it. See how short it is. See how you probably could have written a better book. And there's nothing more um, inspiring than thinking, well, this is successful. Why can't I do that? Um, <laughs> and I kindly offer my books up for that because it was my first book and it was an exercise in learning how to publish a book. And so I just let it, there's so much to do and you have to decide like, what it takes to just move forward and that perfectionism <laughs> I let go of big time in those first early books I've gone back and fixed them to some extent uh, but I highly recommend anybody who wants to write a book to read some of mine and go I I'm sure you'll be inspired to be like I could write one of these and you can well, I'm sure you're being your own harsher critic but oh it's no I mean I don't advice. mean there's like there's a concept on I I think they're fine books I think they're yeah, good yeah. people like them but they're not perfect there, you'll right. see a lot of imperfections and that doesn't take away from the charm of the book. Something can be a little bit messy or a little bit less or considerable less than perfect and still be good enough. Like, I think there's this weird thing where people think they have to be absolutely great. And I think in the beginning, it's not a matter of like finishing a race at the best time and getting to the finish line and winning the race. It's about like completing the race. Just mm -hmm. learning what it takes to go through a race and not being afraid of people judging you. So I don't mean it to put down my book because a lot of people love those books. I love those books, but they're not perfect. They're yeah. completely imperfect. And um, and I kind of like that they're out there like that so that other people can see, hey, uh, you'll even read the reviews. You'll see people say, there's a lot of typos. And she changed the, <laughs> like, I think on one of my later books, because I was against a deadline. She like changed the the age of the guy like three times. And I did, uh, but I didn't realize I hadn't gone back and fixed it until after the book was published. And then I went back and fixed it. Um, but so yeah, yeah, you can have errors and it's still okay. That is gold um, and really appreciated because that's probably a crucial ingredient to, to bake the cake, like to finish the race, to get it done. It's just, I got some really good advice once it was better published than perfect. And if you make it perfect, it's never going to be perfect. Then you're going to miss your window. And, and that in itself is a driving factor. So thank you. I, I really wanted to ask you too, like you've got this incredible, I'm going to get into your comedy side in just a second here, but because of your natural exuberance and you've already, you've done the, the romance kind of style and you've done the, um, the, the, um, mystery which I'm sure has some comedy in it but do you have plans for any other genres or any kind of style that you might move to in the future you know I'm really looking to get into nonfiction. as I've gotten older oh. I'm 52 I would love to because I very much enjoy talking about the process of what it takes to do things and I think when I started reading a lot more nonfiction and discovering more about what it takes to actually do it as far as craft goes you know, the thing I love about craft, if you're looking to do something conversational, readable, I like the scene sequel me method, which is just basically, and it, it doesn't even have to be each scene, but you put in each scene, which is the goal. Every character has to have a little bit of a goal, conflict, and then um, disaster. So it's like, I'm headed for something like you could just mean all I want is a cup of coffee. But then, uh, you know, I ended up tripping over the dog and chipping my tooth or, or stubbing my toe. And then I couldn't get that. And then before that happened, um, the guy I had a crush on shows up to deliver a package and I'd rip my nightgown or something. That's a disaster. And then the next scene or the next part of it is the reaction and then a dilemma. So the reaction is I did this and now I have a dilemma about, you know, I'm going to run into him tomorrow when there's a girl I like or whatever the girl that I worry that he really likes is going to be there and I'm going to decide to dress up or something. And then it's, so the next goal is the goal to get dressed up. And then the conflict is um, that, you know, something else goes wrong and then there's another disaster and you just keep rolling those together to keep that loop open. I think the biggest error people make when they're doing scenes is they, um, they kind of put an ending to that scene. Like they, they answer all the questions and they don't reopen a thread and then the scene ends. Mm. And that is a quick and easy way for somebody to shut the book. Right. And so they, that's the difference between writing an essay and writing a longer period piece of work is that people have a tendency to want to close loops while they're going. And the point to a novel is to keep opening loops and slowly, mm -hmm. and then you close them in the order that you open them. So the last right. thing that you opened up, which is like, I usually open up with a murder at the end, there's a little, we, we know who the killer is. And then there's a little, cause I start with, a, there's a slice of life that goes into the murder, right? So yeah. at the end it's solve murder back to slice of life. Um, so I guess it's a long way of saying um, I enjoy talking about what it takes to do things. Um, 
and I would like very much to get into uh, writing about that because I've spent it's been really hard. Like I, I love talking to other writers because and also the first book, by the way, the hardest. It's the easier hardest. after that. It's way easier. Each yeah. time that you think I'm never going to finish this and uh, what, what my, whatever, whatever made me think I could do this. Like it always seems like a great idea when I start and then yeah. somewhere between two and, you know, two the second day and the, I don't know, 200th day uh, is where it gets hard. And then, then there's that, like that end where for me, like where I'm like, I, everything clicks together and I realize, oh, also it directly coincides with me with a deadline that I've been procrastinating on. So I'm like up for days, but I'm learning mm-hmm. how to. <laughs> yeah yeah I have a I have a therapist who's helping uh, like a like an executive functioning style therapist who's helping nice. me uh yeah break things down into doable pieces and so you know yeah, well, we I all need we all need therapy but I also <laughs> think like you would be so good at that because one it's so naturally um embedded in you how the formula works and you know to trust the process so well that's ingrained in you that you're giving up is not a giving up it's like a you don't have that function because you know it's just a part of the process so like when you have a writer's block um what's your kind of go-to do you walk away from it do you um I must have my my coffee here and do this there do you, what's your process for writer's block oh you know Becca Syme, who does uh, strengths for writers, she uses the Clifton Strengths to like you take this assessment t- test through like Gallup or whatnot, and it tells you what type of person you are. And um, I'm what they call futuristic strategic, right? So I've learned that when I have a block, it's usually my intuition telling me something has gone wrong, and it's mm-hmm. preventing me from moving forward. So I don't do a lot of work into nowhere. So instead of looking at at it for me as a block, I look at it as what's happening here that I'm unhappy with. Do you know what I mean? So I literally, um, and the worst thing you can do when you're blocked is to tell yourself you're blocked um, because yeah. it it makes you feel like you've got to overcome something that may not be overcome. A lot of times it's your intuition telling you something's not exciting about this next scene. So maybe I don't want to write it or something has gone slowly um like just got off the trajectory. So I don't. So the biggest thing for me is to stop and think, why, why don't I want to write this? Sometimes it's something in my life that's going wrong that I need to attend to. But a lot of times it's something in the manuscript. And so that's a time for me to go, okay, I'm going to take a break. I'm going to take a walk or take a long bath, or I'm going to watch a lot of TV. I'm going to uh, sometimes eat snacks that I really shouldn't be uh, that, you know, just like not care about the quality of the snack. And then (laughs) let my subconscious do some thinking but deliberately say something's up like if I if I put it in the back of my mind like instead of asking myself the bad question of why am I blocked to say why am I not moving forward like what is what's with this story right now what's going on with me right now and so I solve that little mini mystery and then things start to click and then it's just a matter of sitting down with a little timer and uh, writing or reading or editing for a certain period of time. And this would be one of the times that I would go back and reread uh, to see if something's uh, and and also check my notes uh, Mm -hmm. and to see if, you know, sometimes it's, there's something flawed with the construction of the story and I need to revisit that, you know, so there's a lot of good reasons, but it's not because I'm what the first thing I go to is I'm being lazy. And this is why I'm not going to finish yet another thing that is that was literally my first thought. And now I've learned to say something's up. Something's up. I'm going to figure out what's up. Dude, this show is called Power Perspectives. And you just so strongly shifted my perspective uh, about what to do in those times. And I love that. I love that advice. That's that's another gold nugget that you just put out there. And I'm going to try these things and come back to you. I'm going <laughs> to probably well, annoy and, you a little bit. but And also, like, this is what I really love about talking to other writers is mm-hmm. when you talk about being stuck and, you know, I'm not sitting down and I'm not writing. They, there's this thing. There's a whole thing that I learned while I was like suddenly making rest- recipes. And another writer said to me, you're procrastinating. You're procrastinating. <laughs> which is you have a deadline and you don't want to, and I was like, cause I don't cook or bake ever. And suddenly I'm baking things. Right. And she's like, you're progressing baking. Um, and I'm like, I didn't even know that was a thing. And what's really cool is when you find yourself, like if you've always wanted to write a book and you find yourself like, I'm just not writing. I haven't written for a week. I just know this, that welcome to the life of being a real writer. That's what it looks like. That's what it looks like 
one first book, that's what it looks like book 20. It, 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 it looks like that every time. So that was really cool for me when I started to hang out with other writers and have all these um, things that I thought were bad or not productive and reasons why I wasn't good. It's exactly what it means to be a writer. So the next time you feel like it's not going well, why did I even write this? Uh, I don't know what I'm doing. You know, all of those thoughts. It's like, welcome to the world of being a writer. That is exactly what it feels like. You're doing it exactly the way it's done. <laughs> well, that feels good. That just felt good in my heart, actually. It resonated. And I think, um, you know, you've got your, your I do affirmations and I do vision I do boards that. and I visualize. And for me to say, like, I make my passwords affirmations and stuff, but to say when I'm not a published writer to announce to myself that I am, um, it's that in, that one little part of inconsistent thought that's not coming to the party that, that I'm now just, you helped me able to kind of shift that. So um, it's part of the process, trust the process, just do the shit and don't start baking. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, or absolutely embrace the breaking, uh, the baking, and call it procrastinate baking, and realize, hey, this is a thing other writers do. You know, it's funny. There you go. The thing about being a published writer that it really bothers me. Um, it really, it really bothers me when you say, "Oh, I'm a writer," and people ask you, "Oh, are you published?" And it's this way of them like pushing back. And it's real. I had the good fortune in the third grade. I won. This is back when there was Arbor Day. I won, I think we mentioned, I think we talked this in a pre-talk. Yeah. I won a poetry contest where I accidentally like stole part of a major poem, but regardless for the first line and then wrote <laughs> the rest about Arbor Day, but I won. Um, and they published that in the newspaper. And so that happened to me when I was nine, right? And so people would ask me, are you published? And I would say, like, I mean, this would be, people would be asking like when I was in the eighth grade, they were like, oh, you're a writer, are you published? I was like, well, um, I was published in the, one of my poems was published in the newspaper. Does that count? And people would say yes. And so I never had to deal with that. Right. I would, after after the first couple of yeses, and especially grown ups hearing like, you know what I mean, like somebody who's twelve or thirteen saying I had a poem published in the newspaper, they're like, oh wow. Um, I never had to deal with that. And so, yeah. but I never felt like there was any difference between what I was writing and what other friends of mine that were writers were writing. And it really bothers me that people judge the quality or the validity of the art by the frame that it is placed in. And it is painful and diminishing. And I am not a fan. I am not a fan at all. So if um, if by chance somebody thinks that my opinion matters more about what it, what it means to be called a writer because I've been published and I've published that many books, mm -hmm. I say, uh, it. do you write? Then you're a writer. That is it. That is it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just, oof. That always I love gets that. To... that. You brought it back to being empowering instead of having to, you know, tick another box of someone else's that takes away from your authenticity of an art. And I, lo I love that. You journal, you're a writer. It's your art to yourself, your own dear love letter to yourself. I love that. Um, one of the things I really wanted to chat to you about because it's, it's in your cells, it is in who you are, is comedy. So oh. most people regard this and, and just as you're, as you're talking about writing and like what diminishes you and just doing things you love, it's, it's what's coming up about you. So it's regarded as one of the scariest jobs in the world or the scariest things to do in the world. It's not just public speaking. It's having to be highly intelligent to make a joke about what, about public speaking. So it's, it's uh, scary on scare. Um, what brought you to that world of, of stand up comedy? Okay, so I had difficulty when I was younger talking to people, um, not in my family, but I like when I went to school, it was in the third grade or was it the second grade in elementary school at some point, um, because uh, I'm half Filipino. And as a kid, I was really significantly darker because in Florida, we just spent all summer at the beach. And so because I was vaguely brown and quiet, uh, there was like a period and, you know, time has no meaning, but it felt like a long time as a kid uh, where they put me in the bilingual program despite the fact that I do not speak oh, no. any other languages but English. Uh, and they were, they kept, and because it was South Florida at the time, there was, a, there was a high, a, um, in Florida, there's a, there at that time in the seventies, there's a lot of kids coming into our schools that were, were Cuban. And so they kept trying to get me to speak Spanish to them. And I kept trying to explain that I didn't speak Spanish, but I was so quiet and meek. So racist. I was never like a class clown or one of those outgoing people. I was always, it, I'm an introverted person by nature. And 
so uh but people think it's funny because i'm um i'm a talkative introvert but i don't come alive in groups that's what like extroverted people seem to come alive i'm an outgoing introvert right uh it right. takes energy but i can do it but at that time i was terrified so but deep down in my heart i thought i had something to say and i thought I saw Jake Johansson on Letterman, and he wasn't the kind of comedian that made fun of people. He re literally was a smart, intellectual type of comic. And I thought, oh, my God, I'd love to do that. And, you know, seven years. It took seven years to get the courage to try it. Uh, it took six years, I think, to even just go to a comedy club because I was too young. Um, yeah. And um, what it was was I wanted to change who I was, and I wanted to change the way people thought about me. Like when I first started comedy, people would be – why are you doing comedy? It was very much like that. And now that I don't do it as much, people are like, oh, of course you're a comedian. I was not a natural comedian. It was my goal. The first, I did well my first two times and then I bombed for a year. And my goal was to not cry on the premises oh. of the comedy club. That included the parking lot because people will see you. So I'd have to drive around the corner into the neighborhood of Uncle Funny's if I wanted to cry, which was just about every time. It was painful, but I wanted to remake who I was. And so I did it. That's uh, got to be a title somewhere. Crying at Uncle Funny's, like crying oh, yeah. in the parking lot of Uncle Funny's. Um, Your goal was trying not to cry. Um, that's that's an I like your standards of goals, but um, did you achieve these goals? Uh, not to cry on the premises. So I did do yeah. that. Uh, there was a lot of tears. I remember, you know, the greatest thing about going into any any type of new endeavor, particularly an artistic one, is the faith that you will be good and the sort of blindness to your faults. Uh, I remember distinctly there was a guy that worked, a manager of a McDonald's who used to, who would be, had been on an HBO Young Comedian special that my brother had talked to. And the guy heard that I just started comedy and um, he said, oh, we'll have her drop off a tape and I'll, I'll critique her act. And I was like, oh, this is fantastic. Uh, you know. <sighs> so I dropped off the tape. And then I came back to the McDonald's and he wasn't available. And then I came back again and then again. And at some point, I don't know if it was the third or fourth, it felt like the millionth time I saw him run away <laughs> and have somebody else come up and say he wasn't there. And then I realized, oh, he doesn't want to talk to me. There's something wrong with the tape. Um, and so I just never went back because I didn't want to bother the poor man. And then later, many years later, I just thought to myself, don't even look at that tape then. Don't even look at it. I looked at yeah. the tape. I was terrible. I was terrible. I was trying. I did suspenders. I was trying on different voices. <laughs> it was a wreck. And it was a very public wreck uh, that I didn't know was happening entirely. I mean, I felt it, but I didn't know to the extent. And I think that was the best thing I ever did for me uh, in stand up. Um, but I wasn't a natural. You know, it, it took time. And, and doing stand up really put me out of my comfort zone. A lot of times uh, I had a lot of anxiety. I still do. And um, and I work through it. But the way I work through it is not to avoid what I'm afraid of. It's like to go headlong into that fear uh, over and over again until you uh, expand. The biggest lie is that your comfort zone is comfortable. It is not. Your comfort zone is absolutely not comfortable. Um, you You know it's not because you do things in that comfort zone like binge television watching, eating, whatever kind of thing that you're doing, what you're doing is you're anesthetizing yourself to your own pain. Um, so, you know, let go of the illusion that the comfort zone is comfortable and uh, go out and do something um, terrifying. That's what Santa puts for me. It was absolutely terrifying. It still is to this day. Wow. And it, so like, I haven't told this to anyone, I think ever, but I'll tell it to you on a recorded um, podcast because that seems cool. Um, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I have all of these, like, in my awareness, no one's doing like a spiritual comedy, like, like, like kind of mocking spirituality in a little, in a, in a way, but, but with love and I call it enlighten the fuck up. And, you know, I have a friend that's also got a book called enlighten the fuck up. And I was, when I was coaching, it was enlighten the fuck up transformation coaching, but um, just a way to like laugh at things, but when, and, and face that absolute terrifying fear and I've been you know skydiving by myself and I've I've been bungee jumping and, and this and that but like standing on a stage okay but standing on a stage telling jokes where you're like did you get it are they laughing please laugh please like me um like what is similar to that feeling nothing <laughs> it, it was a pretty unique 
uh, it, for me, it was anyway, it was a very unique. Now I, I don't do, uh, I mean, I have back issues, so I don't do bungee jumping and I don't, <laughs> I haven't done any of that kind of feeling. It does. It does have a very similar feeling though, I would imagine to like standing. Cause I have stand, stood like on the edge of a high building and I'm, I'm a little, I'm afraid of heights. Right. So yeah. it does have that same adrenaline provoking uh, experience. What's really cool about comedy is I mean, or it was for me, was unlike other types of art, it's, you know exactly if you got it right. It's it's a pass-fail situation. And the ability to take the hit on that failure grew me as a person faster than I think a lot of other things I could have done. Um, because the way to judge a comedian isn't when the laughs are coming. I've seen, I've watched, I've, I've worked with like Maria Bamford. I mean, Emmy Award ring writers, like uh, Zach Galifianakis helped me move into my apartment. Like oh, just, really? uh, yeah, yeah. I've known, I, I know a lot of like a lot of big comics and I've worked with them for years and I've seen them bomb. The difference between a great comic and a passable comic is how well they handle the silence. A comic nice. when you're new, and it took me a long time to learn this, uh, the part where they don't laugh, how you can take that hit is mm -hmm. a really major indicator of who you are as a comedian but it's yeah. also a really good indicator of who you are going to be in life and i've got to say that i've spent a lot of my time and i'm glad that i don't do this anymore but in especially when i was younger and entirely more insecure i spent a lot of time avoiding failure i remember distinctly going to a birthday party it's a roller skating no an ice skating party i'd never been ice skating i'd only been roller skating and i also was an odd kid right being original is great as a grown-up but in middle school painful 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 experience um but i was invited to a party which was unusual and it was a ice skating party so i went to the party and i came home and my dad said how did it go and i said i didn't fall once and my dad said maybe you didn't try hard enough <laughs> uh and we talked about how i was more concerned with not looking bad you know so that maybe i could be invited to another party than having fun at the one party i was invited to yeah. And uh, that lesson has stuck with me ever since. You know, I spent a lot of time avoiding failure uh, when actually the key to being successful is to fail hard often. Love that. You have so many wisdoms within you. And um, yeah, it's clear it's not just from from writing. And it's also so nice to speak to. I speak to a lot of people and um, many, many people uh, that are not writers find it hard to articulate um, their meanings, their essences. Their their it's refreshing to speak to someone that is accustomed to doing that. You don't oh, that's the, cool! Thanks. You, you don't have the same kind of pauses and the same kind of like, what? How do I make this meaning? Um, and and that is a gift. It's a gift to the world, you know. So you're exactly where you're supposed to be doing what you're supposed to be doing, and it's and it's beautiful. I appreciate that. <laughs> also, I spend a lot of time alone in a room, so it's just nice to talk to somebody. Um, we have a lot in common. We should be alone in a room together, not talking. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's always good fun. Or I'll be in the kitchen baking something. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you think that you'll ever do stand-up comedy again? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But there's a season for things. That's another thing I've learned okay. as I've gotten older. Like, I... I used to spend a lot of time wondering why am I not doing this? Why am I not doing that? And then there's a season for things. So um, there was a brief period just before the pandemic, actually, where I was like, should I be doing comedy? And I went out and did two, two shows and then the world closed. And I went, oh, well, there's my answer. Thank you, universe. Now, there were <laughs> comedy shows. My friends of mine were like doing comedy shows um, on the street, outside of the improv, uh, you know, mm -hmm. on microphones where they all brought their own like individual like cover for the microphone. And, and I went, you know, that is really cool, but I'm not. I'm not that deep into it right now. You know, I did, yeah. I did it a long time. I think like, I don't know, it might've been 12 or 15 years. I did over 300 shows just in the laundromats. Um, and I did many other shows there. So that, that was like a long running show, like five years, six years. We even did a tour of laundromats and crashed the HBO comedy festival at the time of their comedy festival. Mm -hmm. I decided to have, uh, it was the, it was, it was last year HBO did their Aspen comedy festival. I did an, uh, uh, a, a, Christy um, laundromat comedy festival. And my favorite thing about that was I called the Aspen daily news and told them, Hey, I've got another comedy festival happening. And they came down and covered it. And a picture of my friend Brett in a dryer was on the front page of the paper next to the HBO 
uh, article, but mm -hmm. mine was bigger and above the fold in the main headline. And <laughs> I just love that. Uh, and then we went around like, uh, I got on like NPR and we ran, went around like flyering under doors until we got kicked out of the, the major hotel there in Aspen, uh, <laughs> letting them everybody know. And it was, it was really fun. We went to all the parties and crashed it. And uh, I almost got a TV show on Fox uh, shortly after that. Um, but it didn't, you know, it, it, but it was a fun couple of weeks. I'll tell you that, but it never happened. That's why nobody's ever heard of me as a comedian. <laughs> Well, they have, they, they will in their hearts and hopefully you'll start it up again and, uh, and, and have something more to share. Cause that you have it like that, you know, that factor, you've got it, you've, you've got it. You, I think you know that. I think it's um, come since I quit. I think <laughs> I needed it. You know, there's this weird thing sometimes where you need it too much. Like I needed, I needed people to laugh too much and, and the world sort of senses that. And I think mm -hmm. now that, uh, I lowered the stakes just a little bit, that's yeah. a, the same thing with my first book, when I finally let go of the need for that book to be great, to be that book that solved everything that yeah. need, like I just wanted so much out of that book um, until I finally, I hit, I think I was like 36 years old and I was like, am I ever going to write a book? Am I ever going to write a book? Uh, mm -hmm. And I went, I'll just write it to write it. And I think that's when I was able to finish it. Sometimes the stakes, the, there's two two ways to solve a problem like that. Either the stakes are too high or they're not high enough. Uh, yeah. that's what, what I'm not finishing. The stakes aren't high enough. So I, I pre, I put the book on pre-order or I commit, uh, you know, money or I, you know, tell somebody I'm going to do it so that I up the stakes. And then other times the stakes are too high. So I can't even start. That's that paralyzing. I'm laying in bed. I should <laughs> be doing things, but yeah. I'm not doing the thing. So whenever you're having a hard time going somewhere, change the stakes, raise or lower, okay. depending on where you're at. Okay. That is great. And also like, so many people can relate to that in whatever field that they're in is like, I put the pressure on myself so much that it's better to just lie down and, and submit to just, I didn't do it. Um, and I think what's really a strength in character is like surrendering. And, you know, when you were saying the, the first time when you were saying I, I had to put it to bed first to, to, you know, know the season for it, I picture um, Neo in the matrix and, and, you know, movie. That Oracle's talking to him. He's just like, you got the gift, kid, but I don't know what you're waiting for. Maybe you have to die. And like, he gets shot, he dies, but then he becomes the one. So like, sometimes it has to die the way that you think it is so that it can be the way that it was always going to be. So I think that's really lovely. I love that. And if you think of life as a narrative in a movie and not one of the arty movies where bad things happen to people and then it just ends, right? <laughs> uh, the, the Hollywood old school movie, the feel good movie, right? The yeah. bottom of the second act. The bottom of the second act is when our hero is down and out for the count, right? So and if you think of your side, especially if you're a creative person and you you, you like a, a, a compelling narrative, right? Whenever you're feeling really down and you can't get out of bed and it feels like your dream has died, right? Just tell yourself, I'm at the bottom of the second act. This is where the hero rethinks everything about the story and then rallies in that last little bit. So know when you're really down and out, you're this close. You're this close to that that third act and that third act moves fast. So the the more down you are, the closer you are to that finish line. Oh, I felt that. And that's the hero's journey, right? You can't, you can't stand at the top of a mountain if you don't stand at the bottom covered in shit for a little while first. Oh, Absolutely. Really well. <laughs> Absolutely. And there's a reason why that hero's journey speaks to us so strongly and why it's like emerged over time and time again, that evolution is because it speaks to, I think, the nature of what it is to be human and alive. Yes, 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 yes. Um, now you shared something really special with me and, and that's that recently um, you were, just very recently, you were diagnosed with an ADHD. Yeah. Um, what did that mean to you being, you know, that this has only come about as a, as an adult and later yeah, in life? I, I, you know, I, you know, I'm 52 years old. So uh, yeah. particularly in girls, uh, they, they didn't diagnose a lot of women. And also I'm what they call 2E, they call it twice exceptional because I'm gifted and I have ADHD. And it was really interesting because a lot of people in my life didn't believe it, uh, that I had it because, and I said, well, do you think my brain works like everybody else's? And they were like, no. And I'm like, what well, do, do you, do you understand though? Like that some things, like I never finished college. Um, people always assume I'm a college graduate because I have a million credits to nowhere. Uh, but if you look at my college transcripts, it absolutely, you'll see like like I changed majors and uh, there was a bunch of incompletes because I got sick and then something happened. And there was just this constant like finishing was a really difficult process for me. What's really interesting is I wrote all of those books pre-diagnosis, 
free treatment. So it took me a long time. So I understand the struggle acutely of not being able to stay on task and not being able to finish. And I had to put uh, into place like a series of pressure. And for me, and it turns out, it was so funny. I went into the Reddit ADHD fact and all of these things that I'd worked hard to put together myself were in that fact. And I'd been on Reddit for like eight years. So I just remember mm -hmm. thinking, oh man, if I would have even just heard the word, that would have given me an extra place to like look for solutions that other people always thought of. And I think that is what is exciting about learning a name for something because it gives you a place to look for solutions. And people mm -hmm. have a lot of thoughts and feelings about whether or not it's real. And everybody has ADHD these days. And honestly, I came from a time where, you know, the medication and uh, mental illness was looked on with a lot of great suspicion, even though I knew I had a lot of those issues. Um, and a lot of my anxiety and depression stem from the unrealistic expectation I had that I should be doing things like everyone else. Uh, so for me, it's really important. And I learned that later to one, let people know that um, I have to limit how many things I can do in a day. I have to externalize my memory. I let people know right away. I have a tendency to forget names. And so when I'm introduced to people, I say, Oh, you know, you know, Hey, I'm Christy Murphy, but it's okay. Uh, if you forget my name, you can ask me every time we meet, forever. And I'll never feel bad because I'm bad with names. And I just say that right off the bat as a way to one, let them off the hook if they're like me. And two, to just get that out there so that people aren't constantly um, being felt like feeling as if I don't think they're memorable because I can't remember their name, mm. that kind of things. So just, just making, giving myself permission and uh, only surrounding myself with people who will understand that uh, what I say and what I mean is what I say and what I mean, not these other things like, yeah. oh, you say I matter, but you don't remember my name. Are you, you know, why is it you can remember this, but you didn't remember that? And it's like, because I have a long-term memory that's amazing, but my working memory is um, flawed. Yeah. And also I think what you're saying, the people that you spend time with or the people that you attract rather, um, you're, you know who you are at this point in your life, like, and you know, what mission you're on and you know what processes work for you and, and the rest of the that will fall away I think the people that aren't meant to be in your life will be there either for a lesson or for a reminder and then they'll they'll fall away and everyone else will just be contributing you know so I love yeah. that you brought up the things that uh fall away because mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest mistakes I used to make was I would one hold on tightly to things for fear that nothing better would come along mm -hmm. and then when I finally got willing to let things fall away there was this emptiness for a little piece, part of time. Mm -hmm. And I was so afraid of that emptiness that I would rush to fill it with the same things that I let fall away. So yeah. uh, a lot of people think um, they confuse a lonely road with an open road. And mm -hmm. I just want to let someone know that if you're in the process of letting things fall away, like you're at the bottom of that second act, right? And uh, a lot of the alliances that you thought were true are not your true alliances. And there's that emptiness. And because I spent my life filling it with things, with anything I could get because I was worried I wasn't worth more, uh, that emptiness felt very daunting and scary. Uh, and it's not a lonely road. It's an open road. So patience is required uh, and just have a little bit of faith um, that the next stage is coming. But the I think I took longer to get to a lot of things, which is fine. Things take the time they take. Uh, and I needed to learn this lesson because I was afraid of that emptiness, which is really an openness. Mm, that's so well said. And just you speaking of that is like knowing who you were before and knowing what, knowing who you are now, like what advice as your hero yourself has gone through this journey, what advice would you give yourself working still on that first book and that first, like, oh, I don't know if I'm ever going to finish this. Like, what advice would you tell him? I guess you kind of oh. gave it to us, but yeah, it's basically that I would also say it's interesting. And, and I don't know if it's a uniquely uh, experience because I'm a woman of my time, but there was a very, there was a very major concern about being big headed. Uh, there's a lot of people looking to humble someone who thought well of themselves. And I, what I really enjoy about this new generation is they're not about that, or at least what the c content I'm consuming that mm -hmm. a lot of the younger women are putting out there uh, is more empowering than they were then. And I would say for me then is to continue. 
I started to fake humility because my confidence was not well received. Mm -hmm. And then that actually turned into insecurity. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think, I think what I would have told myself then the most important thing was to not change who I am to suit others, not be so quick to do that. It's one thing to be polite, but it's another thing to try to force yourself into a mold that isn't for you. I think I would have told younger me to, that it's okay to, to be yourself, like, and, and, and not just privately, publicly. Yeah. That's awesome. And that is, you know, trying to fit a grown, expanded, evolved version of yourself into a smaller box that just was never meant to hold your expanded grown self. So that's, I think, another great, really great advice. Um, yeah, part of that yeah. was me learning to be serious, like being able to, mm -hmm. like, one of the things I did was I, I developed a sense of humor, because I thought it would give me 15 more seconds of someone's attention that I was inherently imposing on. Uh, and the concept that I could be serious at times. I'm not, you know, I do like to joke around, but that I could be serious from time to time is something that I'm literally just stepping into in the last, I think, four or five years. Wow. Yeah. You've given me like 10 things to work on, actually. I think that you would be a phenomenal uh, master your craft coach or master your craft. Like I would watch your TED talk. I would watch your, your next comedy act. I will buy your books. Like, I think you are a great, eloquent and humorous speaker, teacher, writer. So like, wow, you got a whole package there. <laughs> oh, thanks. I appreciate that. I would like to get into more speaking. And so this is great that I get to to be here with you. So I hope you're you doing it. Yeah. All you right. just yeah, manifested awesome. it. Yes, um, I did. Well, Christy, you've got, so all of your books, I think are on Amazon, except for the risque 50 shades of grayish kind of ones, but you've got your books on Amazon, but can you share where, um, where readers can find you and where, where anyone can find your, your stuff? Where can we oh. get more Christy in our lives? The easiest way is to just go to christymurphy.com. There's a link there to my books on Amazon. There's a link to my blog. There's a link to all the, you know, like websites and all my projects all right there. So just uh, Christy with the Y, C-H-R-I-S-T-Y, murphy.com. Um, and you can even get my book one for free. I give it to everybody who goes to the website and gives me their email. So that would be the easiest way for people to find me. Awesome. Well, that's where I'm going to get your first book. Thank you so much. Like, Christy, was, was there anything that you feel I didn't ask or that you wanted to expand upon or you wanted to share with with uh, with podcast viewers? Um, I will just say that the a concept and you you'd mentioned it, the concept that I just recently learned, uh, I can't remember, I think it was a book was called Momentum uh, about changing your life. And it is that you're always creating momentum either for doing or not doing. And sometimes you need to be in a not doing space. You need to rest. So rest begets more rest is to always remember you're likely to do what you just did. So you can restart at any moment, like even right now. So I'm likely to do what I just did by adding one thing, by speaking to you. So I'm more likely to do that again. Uh, but then the next time I want to sort of hole up and be, you know, small or whatnot, um, I can see that I've done that, and then immediately try and do something else different. So to just keep that momentum. So you're likely to do what you just did. So even if you don't like what you just did, it's a chance to turn it around. And if you did something, it's a chance to keep going. I love that. And having having that perspective means that you have to do some introspection. You have to, what am I doing and why am I doing it? And do I like that I did that? And if you don't, then don't do that thing that you just did. I, I really value that. Um, I think you are quite in introspective also. You know, so that is a mark of a good writer, or do you think that's just how you've evolved yourself? I, you know, I do think being introspective genuinely helps me with as a writer. Although I have seen people who are more externalized be great writers as well, uh, and, and actors, uh, people who are very empathetic to other people, so they have a natural curiosity about the world. So I do think it helps me uh, in the type of works that I do. But I don't necessarily, although I do think a lot of writers do have some introspection. So yeah, I do think it helps. Although if if you don't have it and you still want to write, if you have a curiosity about the world, that'll also uh, do very well with writers. Mm, for sure. Christy, this has been amazing. Um, like, thank you so much for your time today.